continuing reading chapter 4 of Paddington at Large. The Browns grouped themselves even closer round their television screen as one of the cameras showed a closer picture of Paddington considering the matter. I think I would like to carry on, Mr. Playfair, he announced at last amid a burst of applause. Although Paddington was not the sort of bear who normally believed in taking too many chances, as far as money was concerned, he was much too excited by all that had taken place that evening to think clearly about the matter. Well, said Ronnie Playfair in his most solemn voice, here for a price of five hundred pounds is the last question of the evening and this time it's a much harder one. It would be, said Mrs. Brown, holding her breath. If, continued Ronnie Playfair, it takes two men twenty minutes to fill a fifty-gallon bath full of water using one tap. How long will it take one man to fill the same bath using both taps? This time you've got twenty seconds starting from now. Ronnie Playfair pressed a button on the clock by his side and then stood back to await Paddington's answer. No time at all, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington promptly. Wrong, exclaimed Ronnie Playfair as a groan came up from the audience. I'm afraid this time you really have got it wrong. It will take exactly half the time. I'm very sorry, Bear, he continued, looking most relieved <laughs> as he gave the gong a bang with his hammer. Better luck next time. I think you must be wrong, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington politely. Nonsense, said the Master of Ceremonies, giving Paddington a nasty look. The answer's on the card. In any case, it's bound to take some time. You can't fill a bath in no time at all. But you said it was the same bath, exclaimed, explained Paddington. The first two men had already filled it once. And you didn't say anything about pulling the plug out. <laughs> Ronnie, <laughs> Ronnie Playfair's face seemed to go a strange purple color in the studio. And even on the Browns receiver it went several shades darker <laughs> as he stared at Paddington. I didn't say anything about them plugging the pu pulling the plug out, he repeated, but of course they pulled it out. You didn't say so, cried a voice in the audience, as several boos broke out. That bear's quite right. Give him the money, cried someone else, as several more voices added to the general uproar. Ronnie Playfair seemed to shudder slightly, as he withdrew a silk handkerchief from his jacket pocket and patted his brow. Congratulations, bear, he said grudgingly after a long pause. You've won the jackpot. What? exclaimed Paddington hotly, as he gave Ronnie Playfair one of his hardest ever stares. <laughs> I've won a jackpot. I thought you said it was five hundred pounds. That is five hundred pounds, said Ronnie Playfair hastily. It's the top prize of all. That's why it's called a jackpot. As the applause rang through the theatre, Paddington sat down on his suitcase, hardly able to believe his ears. Although he knew there must be five hundred pounds in the world, he had never in his wildest dreams thought he might one day see it in, it, in one big pile, let alone be told it was his. <laughs> Ronnie Playfair held up his hand for silence. One final question before we end the program. He exclaimed, and there's no price for this one. What are you going to do with all the money? Paddington considered the matter for a long time as the audience went very quiet. When you usually counted your money in terms of how many buns it would buy, <laughs> it was very difficult even to begin to think about a sum like 500 pounds, let alone decide what to do with it. And when he tried to think of 500 pounds worth of buns, he grew quite dizzy. <laughs> I think he said at last, as the camera came closer and closer, I would like to keep a little bit as a souvenir and to buy some Christmas presents. Then I would like to give the rest to the home for retired bears in Lima. The home for retired bears in Lima? repeated Ronnie Playfair. 
looking most surprised. That's right, said Paddington. That's where my Aunt Lucy lives. She's very happy there, but I don't think they've got very much money. They only have marmalade on Sundays, so I expect they would find it very useful. Everyone applauded Paddington's announcements, and the applause grew louder still. A few moments later, when Ronnie Playfair announced on behalf of the television company that they would to see to it the home for retired bears in Lima was well supplied with marmalade for at least a year to come. After all, he said, it isn't every week a bear wins the jackpot in one of our quiz programs. Well, I'm blowed, said Mr. Brown, mopping his brow. Brow as the program came to an end and the captions began rolling past on the screen over the picture of Paddington as he stood in the middle of the stage receiving everyone's congratulations. I never thought when we bought a television set it would come to this. Fancy Paddington giving it away, said Jonathan. He's usually so careful with his money. Careful isn't the same as being mean, said Mrs. Bird wisely. And I must say I'm very glad. I never did like the thought of all those bears only having marmalade on Sundays. After all, she added, amid general agreement, if it hadn't been for Aunt Lucy, we shouldn't have met Paddington. And if that doesn't reserve a bit of extra marmalade, I don't know what does. The end of chapter 4 I'm beginning to read chapter 5 hoping that it is maximum of 20 minutes total How many pages? Oh, The illustrations are gorgeous Oh, it's a long, long story Well then, I will continue then on another video later The illustrations are made by the drawings, it says. Peggy Fortnum. Well done, Peggy. Chapter 5 of Paddington at Large, A Sticky Time. Mrs. Bird paused for a moment and sniffed the air as she and Mrs. Brown turned the corner into Winter Gardens. Can you smell something? she asked. Mrs. Brown stopped by her side. Now that Mrs. Bird mentioned it, there was a very peculiar odour coming from somewhere near at hand. It wasn't exactly unpleasant, but it was rather sweet and sickly, and it seemed to be made up of a number of things she couldn't quite place. Perhaps there's been a bonfire somewhere, she remarked as they picked up their shopping and continued along the road. Whatever it is, said Mrs. Bird darkly, it seems to be getting worse. In fact, she added, as they neared number 32, it's much too close to home for my liking. I knew it, she exclaimed, as they made their way along the drive at the side of the house. <coughs> <coughs> Just look at my kitchen windows. Oh dear, said Mrs. Brown, as she followed the direction of Mrs. Bird's gaze. What on earth has that bear been up to now? Looking at Mrs. Bird's kitchen windows, it seemed just as if in some strange way someone had changed them from frosted glass while they had been out. For frosted glass. Worse still, not only did the glass have a frosted appearance, but there were several tiny rivers of a rather nasty-looking brown liquid trickling down them as well and from a small, partly open window at the top there came a steady cloud of escaping steam. While Mrs. Bird examined the outside of her kitchen windows, Mrs. Brown hurried round to the back of the house. I do hope Paddington's all right, she exclaimed when she returned. I can't get in through the back door. It seems to be stuck. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird grimly. If the windows look like this from the outside, heaven alone knows what we shall find when we get indoors. Normally the windows at number 32, Winter Gardens, were kept spotlessly clean, with never a trace of a smear. smear. But even Mrs. Bird began to look worried as she peered in vain for a gap in the mist through which she could see what was going on. Had she but known the chances of seeing anything at all 
through the haze were more or unlikely than she imagined, for on the other side of the glass, even Paddington was having to admit him to himself that things were getting a bit out of hand. In fact, as he groped his way across the kitchen in the direction of the stove, where several large saucepans stood bubbling and giving forth clouds of steam, he decided he didn't much like the look of the few things he could see. Climbing up on a kitchen chair, he lifted the lid of, off one of the saucepans and peered hopefully inside as he poked at the contents with one of Mrs. Bird's tablespoons. The mixture was much stiffer than he had expected, and it was as much as he could manage to push the spoon in, let alone stir with it. Paddington's whiskers began to droop in the steam as he worked the spoon back and forth, but it wasn't until he tried to take it out in order to test the result of his labors that a really worried expression came over his face, for to his surprise, however, much he pulled and tucked, it wouldn't even budge. The more he struggled, the hotter the spoon became, and after a moment or two he gave it up as a bad job and hurriedly let go of the handle as he climbed back down off the chair in order to consult a large magazine which was lying open on the floor. Making toffee wasn't at all that easy thing the article in the magazine made it out to be, and it was almost disappointing, particularly as it was the first time he tried his paw at making sweets. The magazine in question was an old one of Mrs. Brown's, and he had first come across it earlier in the day when he'd been at a bit of a loose end. Normally, Paddington didn't think much of Mrs. Brown's magazines, they were much too full of advertisements and items about how to keep clean and look smart for his liking. But this one had caught his eye, because it was a special cookery number. On the cover there was a picture showing a golden brown roast chicken resting on a plate laden with bright green peas, red sauce and roast potatoes. Alongside the chicken there was a huge sundae oozing with layer upon layer of fruit and ice cream while beyond that was a large wooden board laden with so many different kinds of cheese that Paddington had soon lost count of the number as he lay on his bed, licking his whiskers. The inside of the magazine had been even more interesting, and it had taken him some while to get through the coloured photographs alone. But it was the last article of all which had really made him sit up and take notice. It was called Ten Easy Ways with Toffee, Toffee. And it was written by a lady called Granny Green, who lived in the country and seemed to spend all her time making sweets. Granny Green appeared in quite a number of the pictures, and whenever she did it was always alongside a pile of freshly made, old-fashioned humbugs, a dish of coconut ice, or a mound of some other sweet meat. Paddington had read the article several times, with a great deal of interest. For although in the past he tried his paw at cooking various kinds of dinner, he had never before heard of anyone making sweets at home, and it seemed a very good idea indeed. All Granny Green's recipes, recipes looked nice, but it was the last one of all for old-fashioned butter toffee that had really made Paddington's mouth water. Even Granny Green herself seemed to like it best, for in one picture she was actually caught helping herself to a piece behind her kitchen door, and she thought no one was watching. <laughs> it not only looked very tempting, but Paddington decided it was a very good value for money as well, for apart from using condensed milk and sugar, all that was needed was butter, treacle, and some stuff called vanilla essence all of which Mrs. Bird kept in her store back cupboard. After checking carefully through the recipe, once more, Paddington took another look at the magazine in the hope of seeing where he'd gone wrong, but none of the photographs were any help at all. All Granny Green saucepans were as bright as a new pin, with not a trace of anything sticky running down the sides and even her spoons were laid out neat and shining on the kitchen table. There was certainly no mention of any of them getting stuck in the toffee. In one case, her toffee was a light golden brown, 
color and it was cut into neat squares and laid out on a plate, whereas from what he'd been able to make out of his own through the steam, it had been more the color of dark brown boot polish. And even if he had been able to get it out of the saucepans, he, could, he couldn't for the life of him think what he could cut it with. Paddington rather wished he tried one of the, the other nine recipes instead, and after heaving a deep sigh, he groped his way across the kitchen, and stretching up a paw, rubbed a hole in the steam on one of the window panes. As he did so, he jumped back into the middle of the room with a gasp of alarm, for there on the other side of the glass was the familiar face of Mrs. Bird. Mrs. Bird appeared to be saying something, and although he couldn't make out the actual words, he didn't like the look of some of them at all. Fortunately, before she was able to say very much, the glass clouded over again, and Paddington sat down in the middle of the kitchen floor with a forlorn expression on his face as he awaited developments. He hadn't long to wait, for a few moments later, there came the sound of footsteps in the hall. What on earth been going on? cried Mrs. Bird as she burst through the door. I've been trying my paw at toffee making, Mrs. Bird. I've been trying my paw at toffee making, Mrs. Bird, exclaimed Paddington sadly. Toffee making? exclaimed Mrs. Brown as she flung open the window. Why, you could cut the air with a knife. That's more that you can say from the toffee, said Mrs. Bird as she pulled at the end of the spoon. Paddington had left in the saucepan. It looks more like glue. I'm afraid it is a bit thick, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington. I think I must have got my granny greens mixed up by mistakes. I don't know about your granny greens, said Mrs. Bird grimly, as she surveyed the scene. It looks as if you've got the whole pantry mixed up. I only cleaned the kitchen this morning, and now look at it. Paddington half stood up and gazed around the room. Now that most of the steam had cleared, it looked in rather more of a mess than he had expected. There were several large pools of treacle on the floor and a long trail of sugar leading from the table to the stove, not to mention two or three half-open tins of condensed milk lying on their side where they had fallen off the draining board. It's a job to know where to start, said Mrs. Brown, as she stepped gingerly over one of the treacle pools. I've never seen such a mess. Well, we shan't get it cleared up if we stand looking at it, that's a certainty, said Mrs. Bird briskly, as she bustled around, sweeping everything inside into the sink. I suggest a certain young bear had better get down on his paws and knees with a scrubbing brush and a bowl of water before he's very much older, otherwise we shall all get stuck to the floor. Mrs. Bird paused. While she'd been talking, a strange expression had come over Paddington's face, one which he didn't like the look of it at all. Is anything the matter? She asked. I'm not sure, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington, as he made several attempts to stand up, and then hurriedly sat down again, holding his stomach with his both paws. I've got a bit of a pain. You haven't been eating this stuff, have you? exclaimed Mrs. Brown, pointing to the saucepans. Well, I did test it once or twice, Mrs. Brown, said Paddington. Gracious me, cried Mrs. Bird. No wonder you've got a pain. It's probably set in a hard lump in your inside. Try standing up again, said Mrs. Brown anxiously. I don't think I can, gasped Paddington as he lay back on the floor. I think it's getting worse. That poor bear, cried Mrs. Bird. All thoughts of the mess in the kitchen banished from her mind as she hurried into the hall. We must ring for Dr. McAndrew at once. Mrs. Bird was only gone a moment or so before the door burst open again. The doctor is out on his rounds, she said. They don't know when he'll be back. They can't even find his locum. They can't find his locum, repeated Paddington, looking more worried than ever. That's his assistant, explained Mrs. Brown. There's nothing to get upset about.